Okay, and now for the first speaker of the evening. There is, uh, you know, mostly when you say somebody is too good to be true, that's because very few things really are. Sharad Paul, Dr. Sharad Paul, is the exception. He is a doctor, a researcher, an academic, a surgeon, a skin cancer surgeon, a plastic surgeon, an entrepreneur, a very, very successful author, I think a New Zealand Herald, New Zealand is where he's based, and New Zealand Herald named him correctly Renaissance Man. Dr. Sharad Paul has single-handedly, in New Zealand, taken down the waiting time for skin cancer surgery from one year to one month. His clinic has performed 50,000 surgeries over the course of the 32 years that he has been a skin cancer surgeon. He has seen 150,000 patients. Now, just to give you a context, when we were speaking earlier, he mentioned the next closest figure for somebody who has performed that many surgeries or seen that many patients is 18,000, right? So, Sharad has a lot of these are pro bono. He sees 3,000 people pro bono every year. He is committed to the idea of health and wellness, and that has come through not just in the surgeries that he does and in his medical practice. But most interestingly, he has written a host of books. The, one of the, the key ones before the new book that he will probably speak of today, but one of the key ones is called Skin. And I think the, the particularly astonishing thing about skin, as he says, it's, it's the largest organ that we all have, but it's not an organ any of us sees as doing anything. Except the story of skin is not just the story of an organ, it is the story of human existence. The story of our skin is the story of human evolution. It is of race, it is of color, it is of how we became who we've become. So when he set out to write the biography of skin, he set out to write the biography of us all. And he has followed that up with the genetics of health, which takes on from there. And the genetics of health really deals with the idea of genetics, not so much for the purpose of illness, but for wellness, and there is a crucial distinction there, but it's a distinction that Sharad is better equipped to make than I am. I will hand the stage over to him for his presentation and be back for audience questions later. You're in for a rare treat. Welcome, Sharad Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, there's a little bit of a dash from Jaipur, and I'm going back on the 6 o'clock flight in the morning because I'm speaking there tomorrow. Um, I'm really excited to share this simply because this is really a passion of mine, and I'm going to tell you why am I going to talk about what's the link between skin and what we're going to talk about. Other than the skin being our largest organ, you can't have bad health and good skin because skin just reflects what's going on underneath. So really in my practice, um, I, have, I also run a skincare research lab, and we're always looking for new compounds, you know, from seaweed and this and that, which reduce sun damage, reverse the aging process. And so we started looking at genomics. What we found interesting is that the same genes which are implicated in aging are implicated in chronic illness, cancer, physical stress, like chronic injury, or chronic stress. So in other words, if you're in a really abusive relationship, you will age. If you've got cancer, you will age. If you've got a chronic illness, you will age. So really, what it really ended up becoming is a study of the genetics of health, and that's what this book is about. So I really like to call skin a true mirror. So that's a picture of a real true mirror. I mean, I was in New York um, speaking at the Met, and I was passing this store which had a true mirror, and you know, true mirrors are when you look in a mirror, you're not really seeing your reflection, you're seeing it, you know, um, left to right. So it's actually not what other people see of you. So a true mirror is where they've got two mirrors, 90 degree angles, and a third one, so you're really seeing it as other people see you. We did a survey, and 70% of people who look at themselves in a true mirror think it, the image has been altered. Like they don't think, I don't tilt my head like that, I don't look like that, so you don't actually believe it. And that's how skin is. So really, um, this year, on the 100th anniversary of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, they considered my research groundbreaking enough that they got me to draw my artwork and sign on the cover. But the real message there, the point I was making is wrinkles have been t 
until now looked at as fault lines, right? So in my view, when we look at wrinkles, we look at it pure physically. So we think of getting a new wrinkle, we look at it and we think, okay, I'm just aging. But really what we found is wrinkles actually in different parts of the face, for example, indicate different things. And every new wrinkle that forms ha indicates a new lymphatic vessel forming below it. So if somebody is aging rapidly, then we always know that there's something I need to look for. So I have a scanning machine which looks like that. So the picture is of a friend of mine, and we basically got a map of existing wrinkles, emerging wrinkles, and if you wanted to know how you're going to be in 20 years, right? But what's interesting is we know that for people who have wrinkles in front of your earlobes, there's a 10,000-person study done in Denmark by Tyborg Hansen. They found that wrinkles there are direct indicators of heart disease. So I use this to predict people's heart disease, things like that, before they actually get it, so you can actually prevent these things. And today's talk is really about giving you the tools, and there's more detail in the book, and you know, if people want to take it further, they can do the gene tests. But it's not a must, it's just a message for life. And I'm summarizing it as to eat, move, and live. So let's look at eating first, because I just saw a quote which said that, is it, what would it say is food, the new sex, or something like that came up just a minute ago. So the first thing is about fat genes, right? Because the chapter in the book is called Skinny Brains and Fat Guts, because actually, unfortunately, there's an inverse correlation. So for every two inches you gain here, you lose 12% of your cognitive ability. So the fatter the executive, the worse is memory. No, no, this is a fact. I'm not making it up. This is science. All right. <laughs> so, so, so basically, we know this for a fact that it's purely metabolic, because if you're eating a lot and you've got a big gut, then you have to divert a lot of your energy to that. It's just pure, like, diverting electricity, right? So there's not enough to go to your brain, so the brain has a power deficit. Right, so that's the first message. Now the second thing was interesting because um, there was a study done in Sweden where they had, this was a very interesting study because it was a study which started in 1895 and they followed three generations of people all the way till 1980. It was unbelievable because they followed these families in Oberkalix in northern Sweden. They actually had three generations of people. And what they found is if your grandfather uh, grew up in a time of famine or ate less or was calorie restricted, your grandchildren had a lower ri risk of diabetes and heart disease. If your grandfather overate and picked himself, you increase your grandchildren's risk of these chronic diseases. So the reason for you to restrict your calories is not just for you, but for your future generations. Right. Now the second thing is this is you also end up what you eat. So there was a mouse study done, and that's why I put these mice up, because what they did is they, they put mice on what they call the American cafeteria diet, which was basically cork and uh, fries and things like that, right, for a week. Now, what's interesting is not only that mice put on weight, that's pretty obvious, but m mice developed mood changes. They got paranoid. They didn't like mice which looked different. So it's really, in my view, if you look at what's happening in America, a large part of it is also the diet. I mean, you go to the middle of America, away from the east and west coast. I had to go to Idaho recently, and if I showed you a picture of the food I could find there, you'd know that why sometimes, uh, you know, you, uh, people make decisions like that. So, now what I'm going to tell you is um, where Darwin was wrong. And this is really funnily, I was actually going to talk today about the genes for laziness, right? But then this was by popular demand, people wanted me to include this. I'm going to tell you where Darwin was wrong. So Darwin looked at distribution of various uh, colored races in different parts of the world, Aborigines in Australia, the Eskimos in the North Pole, and he thought, well, you can live anywhere and have any different kind of skin color. But that's not true. So as I pointed out, I was actually one day a week through my career, so I keep myself freelance, so I'm a professor, I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine, but I try and keep myself freelance so I can do my own thing. So one day a week, I teach creative writing to children because, as you know, I'm also a novelist. And I was reading this story to children, and the story was called The Polar Bear Sun. It's actually an Eskimo Inuit story. And really, when I was looking at it, the first thing I thought was, you know, when you're reading with skin, you're always looking at skin. And because I've developed an expertise in the skin, I'm often asked to treat animals, like in zoos and various things. I'm not an animal doctor, but, you know. So, the trick question with children is, what color is the skin of a polar bear? And everybody will say white, but actually the fur is white because it's bleached by the Arctic and it's black. 
And if you look at the Eskimos, it's got dark skin, but everyone else in the North Pole has got light skin. Why is that? See, that's really because the polar bears and Eskimos have virtually the same diet, which is so rich in salmon and cod, their vitamin D levels are so high that their skin didn't need to lighten to absorb it. Whereas in the rest of the European population that they migrated, their skin lightened to absorb vitamin D. So this was a recent thing in England. Um, they did a study of mitochondrial DNA. You know that all European women can be tracked back to um, seven uh, females. So because mitochondrial DNA, unlike, see males and females, we've got DNA, but um, the, in the mitochondria and the male is only transmitted from the sperm. But the problem is the sperm only uses a, mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, right? So the sperm uses all this energy to reach the egg and then it, the mitochondria die a sad and miserable death, right? So the mitochondria of the male doesn't get passed on and it's only the female. So what's interesting is the mitochondrial DNA analysis is actually much more stable unlike regular DNA and mitochondrial DNA changes only about 15,000 years. So literally all modern women, especially in Europe, were just coming down to seven women. So they used mitochondrial DNA to track an ancestor of a fossil they found in Britain and in Somerset and they named him Cheddar Man because it was found in Cheddar Gorge. And this was the teacher um, who was the descendant. Now actually, as an aside, I must say that because mitochondrial DNA in women is really so stable, it's not fickle, it's not easily swayed, really that should be the best argument for more women leaders. Um, so, but anyway, so what happened was, I was more interested in what did caveman eat? Because really, cheddar man, you can analyze somebody's fossils and you can tell what you ate, right? So what's gonna happen in years down the track, they're gonna come to India and they're gonna say, Everybody in Punjab ate rotis, all right? Something like that. So what happened? I said, what did the caveman eat? And he was a big muesli maker. He was vegetarian, largely ate muesli. So what that meant is because we know everybody came out of Africa, we know that he would have been black and over time his skin would have been lightened. So when I said this theory, obviously in Britain, people didn't want to think that they could have a black ancestor, but really this was the BBC recreation of it. So really, so that first Britain was actually black. So this comes back to India, and we look at our caste system. If you think about it outside Bengal, everywhere else the Brahmins were vegetarians. I must point out that you can't eat yourself to whiteness in one generation. It takes about 500 uh, years. Right? <laughs> uh, just in case anybody is wondering. Um, but, but if you were vegetarian, you were getting vitamin D deficient. So over time, your skin lightens and lightens and lightens, and you can see how feelings of uh, that being superior came about. So the same thing happened in Europe when people went out of Africa. So the people who were Africans in Europe, see the skin in Africa became dark for over 28 million years. And modern man went out of Africa only 100,000 years ago. So the people who were darker skinned in Europe, they developed rickets because dark skin couldn't absorb vitamin D. And rickets makes you bent and stooped over and shorter so you can see how feelings of racial superiority came about. But rickets also make you infertile and that's why they got bred out. And so, you know, all over the skin colors were nothing but migration and diet and was just a battle between folic acid and vitamin D. So, like I said, I get to operate on animals. The other day I was called to operate on a lemur or a tumor on the tail and I was trying to tempt a lemur down with an apple and the other one literally, like a human, it literally prayed to me. It had his or knelt down and was literally praying for another apple, apple god, you know. So, see, chimpanzees have longer fur, so they have lighter skin. Um, orangutans in the tropics, so they have darker skin. Right, so that was an orangutan who recognized me a year after I operated on it, she sucked my cheek into her mouth. I was a bit frightened if I move, she might bite, so that turned out to be a good photo, which everybody loves, so I put it up. So, see, the brain is nothing but a computer. So what do computers need? Computers need big cooling systems. So, the, so because of that, we lost our fur. So, but why do we still have hair if we lost our fur? The reason is because hair are our insect sensing mechanisms. So we actually s shaved squares of hair and we found your insect bite rate in the shaved area is about 20 times that of hairy. So I'm not saying that you all have to have hairy legs, but that's really the fact biolog biologically. So out of Africa, from apes to humans, it was a 28-year process. So basically, the folic acid, and it is all about, evolution is all about propagation of species. Genes are all about propagation of species. They don't care whether you're happy or healthy or everything. 
it's all about the species. So what happened is, if you put folic acid and expose it to light, the light destroys it. So what happened in Africa is over 28 million years, African skin darkened to preserve folic acid. People migrated to Europe, it lightened. People migrated back to a, over to Asia, like in India, it again darkened to preserve folic acid. That's why countries with darker, see this is a map of folic acid and this is a map of world population. It's literally darker continents have a larger population simply because they have lower birth defects. In India, you know, when I did medicine all those years ago, nobody even heard of giving folic acid, but there were very few birth defects. We compared a slum in Bombay with a wealthier suburb in Belgium and birth defects were lower. So, so really, it's no accident, you know, people think, oh, you know, this duck, I come from New Zealand, and the Maori, the indigenous population grows faster than the regular population. So people say, oh, you know, they're breeding. And this, but the fact of the matter is, it's just darker skin. The darker skin you are, the better the breeder you are, because your folic acid doesn't get destroyed. Frankly, Simpson's a wonderful, you know, social satire. They even had an episode where Mr. Byrne cuts off the sun and Simpson's got rickets in that show. So that's the reason why we suck at track, track and field, basically, and one billion people never won an Olympic gold medal, and recently I was shocked to find that we lost to Bahrain. Uh, right, and the reason for that is directly related to our vitamin D levels. See, Africans, because this process took 28 million years, they have pre-vitamin D levels, and that's four times higher than us, and twice as much as Europeans, which make them natural athletes for track and field. So you can see, the, before the London Olympics, I could pick the track and field winners because you rarely see even a European running in it. But so if you pick sports where you have to run long distances continuously, not stopping and starting like in cricket, then you find soccer is the worst and then probably tennis is next and guess what? That's why we don't have world number ones in those. If you want, then right from childhood, you'll need to supplement infants with vitamin D levels monitored process. And I actually work with high performance sports in some countries and that's my dream to someday be invited to do the same here. So same thing in Australia, the Aborigines are underrepresented in society but overrepresented in sport. They actually have an annual indigenous all-stars versus the Australian all-stars and see that's what happened, they thumped them. So, I mean, I'll skip this slide, it basically shows in the US there was a bit of confusion how African Americans with the lower socioeconomic status had lower birth defects than the Hispanics, but you can again explain it from what I just told you. No, but not all migrations are voluntary. So I actually found this um, painting, and this was actually a reproduction of the slave trade in France. And see, when people were buying slaves in Africa, um, 17th, 18th centuries, they used to lick the slaves, and the more saltier they were, they commanded a higher price. And the reason for that is because they put them in appalling conditions in the holes of the ship, and only the salt-retaining people survived, and the others died. So really what happened is, so if you look at the map of America, and those were southern states, that was the slave population, each dot means 500 slaves, right? So what happened over time is, it's very interesting, because seven in 10 people have a salt retaining gene, but normally you're mixing it with other genes so it's not so strongly expressed. Imagine if you put all salt retainers in one area, as happened in America. So the African-Americans have much more salt-retaining genes, therefore much higher rate of heart disease. And um, so interestingly, in my view, really, the future of prescribing medications, we can pick these for many other things, should be really based on the individual. You see, because biology doesn't have bias, bigotry does. So the moment you say that, people think, oh, you're being racist. But actually, it was artificially created because people were put in an area artificially. So really, the outcomes were artificial. So going back to, I said eat, now let's go to movement. Um, so he, the perfect example for movement is looking at the sea squirt, which next to the starfish there. And sea squirt is an amazing creature because it has two life forms. On one form, it's walking around and all these little tentacles, and the next one is just stuck on a rock. So what it does is it falls in love, basically, with a rock. So it, once it falls in love, it doesn't move. And then it realizes, well, if I'm not moving, I may as well digest my brain. So it's really the moral of the story is if you're going to fall in love with your rock, sit in front of the TV, eat a packet of chips and not move, you may as well eat your brain. Um, because, see, the brain has three types of movements. One is locomotion, right, walking, primitive reflex of grasping, and orienting, which is balance. Any form of exercise which does these three is the best form of exercise for brain function. See, when I was researching this book, to be honest, I thought I would be writing about yoga, and I, I thought, you know, it's getting trendy even in the West, and I thought surely, 
But each exercise I've learned has different things. So yoga is very good for stress, relaxation, lowering your blood pressure. But if you want the best form of exercise to reduce symptoms of Parkinson's or dementia, then it's the tango. Because the tango has all the three elements of locomotion, grasping. Whereas dances like the waltz and things are predetermined. You're going one, two, three, one, two, three. So they're not as free flowing. So, you know, I was in Ireland with, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders and Colm Toybin, and I, my ta talk was titled, Why We Can Finally Forgive the Irish for a River Dance, you know, the dreadful dance. But, you know, you're holding on to people, so you're grasping, you're moving your legs, and you're balancing. So even river dance reduces your risk of dementia. So now let's go to, uh, I thought I'll keep it short so that we can then have plenty of time for questions. Um, I, one of the things I do, like I said, in teaching these children to read and write. So I used to fund it using a bookstore um, cafe. And for a while, we I became addicted to a little bit of coffee. In 16th century, women actually, when coffee first came about in Britain, they actually wrote a petition to Parliament saying this terrible liqueur had made the men eunuchs and they had lost their potency. And then the men still didn't want to give up their coffee, so there was a counter-representation in Parliament, I found it at the British Library. But really, so, is coffee good for you or is it bad for you? Now, what I'm going to tell you is going to be surprising. What's interesting is it depends on your gene type. So in this room, 50% of you will be slow metabolizers of coffee, and 50% of you will be fast. So if you're a fast metabolizer of coffee, then actually coffee is good for you. It can be actually beneficial. But if you're a slow metabolizer, if you exceed 200 milligrams, to give you um, Turkish coffee is 150 milligrams, strong Indian coffee would be 150, um, single shot espresso will be 80 milligrams, it's in my book. So if you exceed 200 milligrams, it increases your risk of heart disease and kidney disease. So coffee gene is relatively recent because caffeine came about, so it's a CYP1A2 gene. And so basically when we looked at it, these studies were done in both Asians and Europeans repeated twice, and we looked at coffee intake risk of hypertension and coffee intake and risk of heart attacks. And in both the perfect U-shaped curve, so it's very, very reproducible. So the other gene, so I thought, whoa, I was a bit worried there, because it, but it wasn't intuitive. You know, if I drink coffee in the afternoon, I start getting a bit of palpitation, so I thought, surely I must be one of these slow metabolizers, but I wasn't, so it's not actually as intuitive as I thought. Vitamin C is another one which I find interesting because one in five in this room, 20% of the audience will have a deletion version of the GSTT1 gene, which is your vitamin C absorbing gene. What does this mean? This means that per year, your waist circumference goes up 0.2 of an inch, your blood pressure goes up a teeny weeny bit, your sugar goes up. So it's actually so gradual that it takes 20 years and you no longer look like your university photo and you've got pre-diabetes or you've got hypertension. But you know, the scary thing is, and this is something why I've moved away from the illness model, is medicine is only interesting at that point because that's the only time they intervene. How expensive is it to prescribe an extra orange to you? Because you know, you don't need to take supplements. This is all about just eating it in your diet. If you don't want to do any testing, just eat an orange a day. It won't do any harm to those who have the other variants of the genes as well. That's a gene testing program, the details on my website. So I'm going to talk a bit of stress. Now the stress genes, you know, all of us feel stressed in different reasons inappropriately, yeah? So why is that? Um, and it's really because stress genes was a survival gene because when man left Africa 100,000 years ago, that's, uh, the death rate was one in 20 from saber-toothed tigers and things like that. So I actually looked it up to compare with Shakespeare in time, you know, Shakespeare's books, you know, had a lot of murders and the, all that kind of stuff. So I compared, I looked at what statistics we had for murders at the time, and surprisingly, they were. And it, the murder rate, I think, in London was 1 in 500, and Oxford was 1 in 350. It was surprisingly high. Today, it's like 5 for a million or something, but we still think we live in unsafe times, including all these terrorist attacks and everything else. We live in the safest of times. But why do we carry these stress genes? It's a simple logic. See, the scary cats didn't go and fight the tigers, right? They said, you go and fight, I'll just stay here and I'll sharpen my tools. But sheer law of averages, many of them didn't come back and more of the scary cats survived. So most of us carry the stress genes because they, that was a survival gene because we didn't really fight the big battles. So if you have a stress gene, like I said, chronic stress can lead to poorer health, can lead to weight gain, can lead to other things. So then you need to 
do things like you know, mindfulness, meditation, things like that. The other scary thing with the stress genes are that, you know, increasing things like dementia and Alzheimer's and things like that. We now know that the locus cerealis, which is the area, is actually the, considered the ground zero of Alzheimer's. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, we've been talking about lifestyle things now, and then I'll come to the paradox of generosity. The study was done at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, so there was a study where they took people, you were, it was like a competition with money, and you had a choice of grabbing everybody else's, giving it away to people, or being neutral. And what's interesting is that there is a gene for um, generosity as well. Some people are fundamentally more generous. But the thing I must say about genes are, with your actions, you express more genes. There's a gene for laziness, but if you kept running endurance, you actually switch on to develop the other variants. So genes are a blueprint, but they're not a destiny. So if, even if you are a miserly beggar, you can actually start giving and then you'll become generous. But what's interesting is, what I found is that the generosity genes led to 50% better health. So the real reason for you to give may be a selfish one, it's good for your own health. So one of the things I did, other than literacy programs now, is that's a little classroom we built in a school, and we teach nutrition to the parents and the children about healthy cooking. Because the thing in India, what I find is, when I come back home, it's just far too much processed food. Vegetables are cooked so much to death that what little vitamins there cannot even rear its little head out. So one of the things we try and teach is how can you cook to be healthy? And really, I think that brings me to the end of it. I'm happy to take questions. There's all my books, and thank you, and live well, and all the best. The Wait, light yeah. is so bright that I can't. Yeah. Can the person? Oh, yeah. Very interesting talk, uh, engrossing indeed. And my question is uh, regarding vitamin D. Yes. If uh, the level of vitamin D is more than 50, uh, it leads to you know uh, cardiovascular uh, incidents. Uh, what is the exact cause for that? Okay. So, so the, the actually interesting thing is really vitamin D is your calcium regulator, right? So if you actually um, so if you put my name and you put TED, there's a TED talk on it, which answers your question. But the short answer is basically, vitamin D is a calcium regulator. So the real problem in India is because, like I said, we have low vitamin D levels, but we consume a lot of dairy and calcium. So if you're consuming, there's no problem if your vitamin D is low and you're not consuming any calcium. But when you consume calcium, what happens is it becomes intracellular calcium. It increases your heart disease and diabetes rate. And that's the reason why we see the epidemic here. Many times people simply take calcium. I say, why are you taking calcium? You know, and they're like, oh, it's good for my bones. It's going to be terrible for you if your vitamin D is not corrected. So, so the thing is, so when I'm talking about supplementing, I don't mean you need to take a pill. You only need to take a pill if it's low. Right, but what I'm trying to get at is, so if people were vegetarians, then they may have to take a pill. But if otherwise, you have to eat fish, which has vitamin D. But fundamentally, the issue is, if your vitamin D is low, and you're consuming calcium, then you increase your risk of this chronic disease. It might be useful for me to do this. Sorry, our speaker too decided he wanted a pre-conversation to the conversation, and I can promise you, you want to hear him. Uh, sorry, were there questions? Yes. Somebody will just bring a mic to you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. So I've been hearing a lot about um, gene testing, you know, um, gene testing for weight loss, for better health, for prediction of future problems like cancer, etc. cetera. Um, is there something that you can elaborate on and perhaps educate me on, you know, its, it's value and, and, and perhaps how to get it done? And, it, you know, thank yeah. you. Uh, I think, first of all, there are three types of um, gene testing. So the most common one you hear about, like companies like 23andMe, those kind of stuff, is what we call WGS, or so whole genome sequencing. So they sequence your whole genome. Um, they're really looking for illness risk, largely. They do some lifestyle things, like what I mentioned, but really, fundamentally, it's looking for illnesses. Now, the concern I have with it is many of these illnesses 
it's not a direct, easy to understand risk. So let me give you an example. Say Angelina Jolie, for example, she made gene testing famous because the real reason I got into this is when we deal with aggressive skin cancers like melanoma, the first thing we test is the gene type to see whether they respond to a particular medication, but we don't do it for day-to-day -day thing. So in Angelina Jolie's case, she had a positive BRCA1 gene, so she decided to lop her breasts off, right, or surgeon did. So what happens is, but only 5% of breast cancer people actually carry that gene. So you, so you can see how the, the anxiety of doing these things can, like I said, anxiety, the stress is bad for you itself. That's one. Now, the second problem I had in America, is like when I went to the U.S. and I was discussing this gene testing, everybody is like, all these companies, you sell your data sneakily back to the insurers. So they were like, would you sell us anything? I said, no, of course not, because that goes against my philosophy of what I'm trying to do, and I don't test for illness. So what if somebody knows I can't drink coffee or can't? But what's interesting is, so there is real implications down the track with whole genome sequencing in places because, as we know, now we're constantly monitored, and I actually think over-monitored, so in this kind of situation. The second type of testing is RNA, which is really for microbiota, not as accurate. So what I do is we've just taken 21 genes which have the evidence based and the single changes in it, which means if you did something, you will see an actionable benefit. So it's just a different approach. Eating plain salt. They love eating plain salt. What do you think could be the reason behind it? Should we allow them or not? Eating plain salt? Plain salt. They are fond of salt. And if the parents don't allow it, they feel very depressed. I think first thing is um, we know from studies that if a child was given more salt, they grow up with a salt preference. Right? So as an infant, if you have anything salty, later on you're going to like salt. Now. Going back to the salt, we consume far too much salt because the genes evolve slowly. Genes evolve over 50,000, 100,000 years. So ancient man left Africa the same genes as us. They used to consume 1.5 grams of salt a day. That's it. Right. And what happened was the Chinese then first found out that salt was a preservative. And then the, any time you put something in a packet, salt is used as a preservative. So we know that one packet of instant noodles here, which I looked at, has 880 milligrams already. That's your half your day's quota gone. So the point is, most of us consume five grams, something like that, in India. And reducing it by one gram in the UK in a study showed that you prevent 65,000 deaths from sequelae of hypertension. Thank you. Sorry, if you just give me a moment. Uh, Sharad moderator's prerogative and a question I wanted to ask you before, but I think that everybody might be interested in. Things that we believe are learned behaviors, I know you mentioned uh, laziness as a gene, you mentioned, say, procrastination, and we also had a conversation earlier. I'm interested in whether things like faith and religion and things that constitute, for us, we believe are learned, acquired beliefs, are there genetic basis for these, or are they only a function of nurture? See, everything has a little bit of nurture and nature. I mean, like, for example, I'll, I'll come to the second part, but first to answer your question is actually yes. So, uh, yes, so there, there is, is, a, there is, there is a, gene a gene for faith, yeah? Um, and I actually think we should use it, and I'll explain how it works. So there's a study which I mentioned in the book, uh, Ted Kapchak at Harvard, did it, they did seven, these were patients with intractable migraines which they could not get rid of. So we had three groups. So 70, per, 70 of them were put on the migraine pill, 70% uh, 70 were put on acupuncture, and then 70 were given nothing, right? or they were given a placebo. But what was interesting, it was a nocebo trial. So the guys, but what was interesting is the guys who took the medication, who thought 70% got better, acupuncture was 50, and nobody got better on the placebo, but they were the ones taking the real pill. Right, so it was a nocebo trial rather than a placebo trial. So we then looked at what was common between the people who got better on nothing and who didn't get better on something, and it was the same gene. Right, so it's a dopaminergic allele of the COMPS gene which indicates your faith. So what it means is for these people, see, one thing I must stress is faith cannot shrink tumors and it cannot cure cancer, it cannot unblock your arteries, but it can do things like symptom relief. So if you've got spinal pain, you've got suffering with pain, that kind of stuff. So, so in my view, if you look at non-scientific things like homeopathy, non-scientific simply because there's just not enough um, uh, substance in it, then it will work, but we can pick whom it's going to work for. So in my view, there's nothing wrong in it. If you know whom it's going to work for, for pain relief and things, why not? Why, don't, why give them a medication which has 
I'm in the minority view here, but I actually think, well, well, you know, if I was running a cult, you know, you just swap them all first and you only bother selling stuff to the gullible. So it's basically the faith gene is uh, like a gullibility gene as well, I suppose, yeah. Thank yes, you. sir. Up front. There are two questions. One is about the vitamin C. Yeah. Linus Pauling, the Nobel Prize winner, said that you should take two, uh, two shots of vitamin C, 500 milligrams each. And it, it, it helps in your metabolism. That is one. And uh, how far it is relevant today in the, yeah. in the context. And, that, uh, and second question is, how do you manage stress with... Uh, with the with the with the with the, uh, with, the uh, with the problem which are hybrid, uh, everybody is facing these days. I, I think the simplest things are like I said, stress, really mindfulness, meditation, uh, you know, uh, staying free, um, free of devices and things for a while, away from blue light, all that kind of stuff. But going back to your uh, Linus Pauling question is interesting. He didn't have the benefit of genomics. So, but here's what it is: we know the people who definitely need more vitamin C. Um, but really, the best form of it actually is more in natural form in eating oranges. So I did a study where we looked at vitamin C is particularly good for what we call xenobiotic metabolism. If you eat too much in the form of pills, the body recognizes as foreign. That goes for most vitamins. You know, you should have it in more natural form as possible. If you take too many supplements, all you're creating is such an expensive urine that you may as well bottle it and sell it. Um, uh, so, so I really think... But to answer your question, one orange a day will give you more than 150 milligrams. If you particularly had that gene, then you should eat more citrus. But yeah, but, but I must qualify, if you're taking it in a pill form and you are undergoing treatment like chemotherapy or something, at that time you will do worse if you're taking supplements because when your body is trying to fight its normal stress response, anti-stress response, it's called the NRF2 pathway, and then you're taking supplements which are antioxidants, your body's own antioxidants don't work so well because it thinks, oh, I've already got some. So that's why when we have people on chemotherapy, we ban them from taking vitamin C and other things. Because unfortunately, that's not human nature. You should take these things when you're feeling well. If you want to take supplements, go ahead, but take it when you're saying, I'm feeling great today. But that's not human nature. Someone's going to tell you, oh, you're looking a bit stressed, you take this. But that's not how it should be. Okay, couple of questions more, ma'am there, since you've been waiting, and then somebody at the back, and we'll... Dr. Shah, good to hear what you've said. I myself am a cancer survivor. I have used food for healing. I mean, I did go through chemotherapy, and I completely agree, no supplements. I've taken my hemoglobin from 6 to 14 just on food with no supplements. I just want to know from you, what are you doing for India where you see disease as an epidemic, whether it's cancer, whether it's uh, lifestyle diseases from heart to, you know, BP and stuff like that. So what in your, all your findings and initiatives, how are you focusing on India to make sure we have better health out here? Yeah, I think first of all, people have to let you, <laughs> right? Um, India still functions very much on an illness model, right? I actually tried to bring these programs a couple of years ago to India, but most of the hospitals were like, really, we make more stuff for, most of the money is made at the other end of life. Right, or most of the money is made at the other end of intervention. So if a hospital is generating 80% of the profit from heart surgery and things like that, they were like, what is going to be the outcome of this? And I'm like, you're going to have 50% less people having bypasses. You're going to have maybe 75% less diabetics. You're going to have mostly people without high blood pressure. Right, so for example, a Cochrane review, Cochrane is the ultimate in medical reviews. They showed that for mild hypertension, there is no evidence even. So that's what we call medical creep. We know that in this room, 15% of the people will have high blood pressure. Yeah. Okay, you're all treated. How do we find more customers? So you start treating, saying, okay, the mild ones will benefit. There's really no evidence for mild hypertension. So I think this explains... I, I, have, a, this I have a question about... Oh, sorry, question? Where, yes, I'm okay. right here. Yeah, and that's the last question, unfortunately, but Sharad yes. is available afterwards. It's about how does generosity change the genetics? I can understand it changes the physiology, but how does it change the genetics? Yeah. No, it's basically because genes, it's not just one gene which does everything, it's not so precise. You normally have a multitude of them. So what happens is if you are doing things in that and you're secreting those chemicals, the genes just make proteins. So then you start expressing those proteins which trigger other genes which also do similar stuff. There are some people who will naturally have the gene, they're extremely altruistic and they only will be givers. 
but anybody can learn to give. But likewise, I was talking endurance was where this was largely studied is people who had the laziness genes, if they start running endurance, like running marathons and things, they actually start producing higher levels of BDNF, which is a bone-derived neurotropic factor, which makes you more athletic. So you're saying the action, There's hope can, for everybody. Trigger, the Absolutely. action can trigger the activity that further... That's exactly. So what it, that's what I mean. Genes. So there's hope for all of us. So we have to just view genes as a blueprint, and some of you may have a slight advantage somewhere else, and that's what we can use. But for everyone else, the basic rules, and those rules are in the book. So, so there's hope, but there's no excuses. That's right. On that both happy and unhappy note, um, thank you, Sharad. I think, um, and the genetics of health is an essential read. And I think the distinction that Shara draws, again, as, as we said in the beginning, between sickness, so medication or medicine for sickness and medication or me medicine or health for wellness are, are a difference in approach. And that approach will start, um, I think the medical practice needs to imbibe that approach, even though there are fewer paying customers at the end of it. I think the way I look at it is it needs to come from probably a more public health approach, which we don't have in India, which like in places where you have a more a national health kind of a model. But the other thing is, see, after medicine, I studied law, philosophy, ethics, I'm full of useless information. But one of the things I say, I often said this is, just like law doesn't always translate to justice, because it's law is a guild. Just like that, medicine doesn't translate to health. If you want health, you have to take personal responsibility. Thank you, Sharad, and thanks very much.